Welcome to the Infectious Disease Detection and Surveillance, or IDDS, project webinar. This webinar is being recorded. The recording will be shared later this week with all registrants. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Questions for the Q&A session can be typed into the questions interface on this platform. Information materials are available via the handouts button. And now to turn over the, to Mo Moore to open the program. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining us for this webinar on Laboratory Network Spatial Analyses, hosted by the USAID Supported Infectious Disease Detection and Surveillance Project. We have an excellent panel of speakers who will present on the methodology, context, and outcomes of analyses in high TB burden countries. Today, you will hear from Amy Piatek, Senior Tuberculosis Technical Advisor, Bureau for Global Health USAID, Alex Jurena, TB Diagnostics Technical Advisor, Bureau for Global Health USAID, Claire Lay, Data Analytics Senior Scientist with IDDS, So Tut Ong, Program Specialist with IDDS in Burma, Ramon Basilio, Department Head, National Tuberculosis Reference Laboratory, Research Institute of Tropical Medicine, Philippines, and Ebert Mutanzi, Senior Diagnostic Specialist, IDDS in Zimbabwe. Laurel McMillan, Principal Technical Scientist with IDDS, will moderate the question and answer session with the speakers. As mentioned, today's webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be made available afterwards to all participants. To participate in the moderated Q&A session, please use the Q&A feature to ask questions of the panelists. In 2018, the international community came together at the United Nations high-level meeting on the fight against tuberculosis and recommitted to end TB by 2030. One of the key pillars of this commitment is the detection and diagnosis of all persons with tuberculosis. The current international standard for diagnosis of TB uses World Health Organization recommended rapid molecular diagnostic tools instead of smear microscopy. The laboratory network spatial analysis is a tool to forecast testing needs in countries and regions to determine the number and location of molecular testing platforms needed. The spatial analyses are future focused. They ask what is the current demand and current capacity for testing, and therefore what is the forecast demand and the necessary testing capacity to meet that demand. The analyses then provide recommendations to findings to recommendations to countries to respond to these findings. And now I turn to Amy Piatek of USAID to offer some introductory remarks. Amy. Thank you so much, Mo. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today, and I welcome everyone to this really exciting webinar of some pretty um, significant work that, that the project has been doing over the past several years. You know, as Mo has already stated, you know, one of the greatest challenges for national TB programs is early detection and diagnosis of TB cases. Even though the first rapid molecular test for TB was introduced over 10 years ago, Globally, only one third of all notified TB cases are diagnosed with a rapid test. Countries have really struggled to increase access to these life-saving diagnostic tests. One of the biggest challenges has been the lack of sufficient resources and capacity to appropriately roll out and scale up a coordinated network of rapid diagnostic test instruments. It has been very difficult for countries to strategically place instruments based on need and burden and also within specimen referral and transport limitations. With the development and implementation of a country-owned data-driven tool to map out the placement of testing instruments, countries have been able to increase their ability to better understand access issues and help more people reap the benefits of faster and more sensitive tests like Expert and TrueNet. The ITDS consortium's technical expertise an on-the-ground presence <clears throat> has significantly contributed to the tool's success, and I'm very pleased for the project to present some of the work they have supported over the past few years, including the, including the improvements to the overall tool design and specific analysis done in Burma, Philippines, and Zimbabwe. I'd now like to introduce my colleague, Alex Dorina, who will provide some historical context on the TB laboratory spatial analyses. Alex is currently a TB Diagnostic Technical Advisor in the Office of Infectious Disease, Global Health Bureau at USAID. He contributes to improve TB diagnosis coverage and results and to strengthen the diagnostic network in USAID priority countries. Over to you, Alex. Thank you. 
Thank you, Amy. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll be glad to provide a, a brief overview of the you know, on Israel context for the um, abstract analysis, and also um, talk about the importance of this um, um, approach that we've been using since 2019. Next slide, please. So we came with the idea to develop the lapse analysis in 2019 during the TBGNA in Uganda while conducting the pre-assessment data collection and, and, and analysis process. Um, at, this, at this time, there was a need to find an efficient approach to present, report, and analyze um, TBW data, mainly to the change in the diagnostic landscape. We have um, upgrades um, of the TB testing instruments from Smirokosupi to, to Genesper. Also, there was also a, a need to expand the GSPER instruments to additional areas in, in Uganda at, um, at this point of time. So we, we you know, an analysis, analysis was then required to assess the dense capacity and coverage by facility, and also by defined administrative areas um, in Uganda at this time, while considering also the type of TB test available, the quantity of tests performed, and, and the, the, the rapid molecular genesis coverage. The country also wanted to have a clear picture of the expert instruments or modules that they may need in order to, to, to fulfill their, their genesis purposes. And you know this approach was refined over time. The one you use in Uganda was also used in, in 2020 to conduct the special analysis in Zimbabwe and in Vietnam. Back, back then, the analysis was, was mainly based on the visual interpretation to an eyeballing of the maps, displaying the location of the instruments and also the population density. But currently, we improved this approach over time. And now we, we're comparing and, and, and we propose scenarios that we compare and we give option to the country to select which one will be more appropriate based on their context and, and, and also to, to, to see how we can better improve net network efficiency. Next slide, please. So about the importance of the special analysis. So, so far, the last special analysis allows us to assess the molecular testing population coverage by looking at the activity of the population as a function of distance to the rapid molecular diagnosis, either expert or not. This allows also to identify areas not covered by rapid molecular diagnosis and also areas with limited access that should be prioritized to improve network um, expansion. No, for network expansion and, 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 and optimization. This analysis also allows us to measure molecular testing network capacity and, and helps identify areas that are under equipped in which existing um, instruments is operated near or above maximum capacity, and also those where in, in which you know the 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 uh, areas of facilities over equipped based on the domain and the facilities workload and and this the 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 network capacity is 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 becoming more important due currently to, to, to the fact that countries are considering using those instruments for for multiplexing and, um, and also it allows us to measure the effic efficacy of, of the simple flow system which can, can later help to optimize and, and expand the referral network. Overall, um, we are able to formulate recommendations to, to countries to efficiently increase coverage and address capacity issues tailored to the country context, their needs, and also uh, the issues that they define in, in, in their TB and lab national strategy plans. Over to you, Mo. Thank you. 
Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Alex. We very much appreciate the partnership and collaboration and, and support we received from USAID. Now I'd like to hand over to Claire Lay, who will present on the general methodology of the TB Laboratory Network Spatial Analysis. Claire, welcome, and please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mo. Next slide, please. So first off, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of what we're doing, why use spatial analysis, some goals in the overview of what we're doing, and then some methods of spatial analysis for TB diagnostics, uh, network analysis using spatial analysis, um, including the key questions, some data requirements, and then conclusions and an introduction to the uh, next speakers. Next slide, please. <clears throat> next slide. Next slide, please. Slide is advanced. Um, so uh, I will talk just a moment. Uh, the uh, main reasons that we perform spatial analysis are to uh, ensure accessibility to the population um, by improving routes and linkages for specimen referral, identifying issues in access due to distance and supply, and understanding the most efficient way to improve access to diagnostics. And that might be adding supply in remote areas, incre increasing supply in dense areas, referral network formalization, um, formalizing the linkages between specimen referral network facilities, um, or maybe in some cases adding mobile diagnostics and particularly in accessible areas. Next slide, please. So the goal of this project is to help decision makers use location-based analysis to develop targeted solutions for improving access to TB services. Our focus is to analyze population accessibility and TB surface capacity to characterize coverage and identify gaps. Some things that we consider as part of this are supply. How much testing capacity is currently available and where is that testing capacity located? demand, how much testing capacity is needed now, and uh, that's based on some historical data sets, and how much might be needed in the future based on projected values. And then access, how can TB diagnostic tools be made more geographically accessible? Next slide, please. Okay, so for supply, how much testing capacity is currently available and where? We often use the number of modules or the, the test capacity of each of the gene expert machines and identify their location and their inventory. Um, we identify testing laboratory locations, find the capacity of tests available at each location, both functional and total, um, and uh, we can, with the spatial analysis, combine capacity for nearby facilities. So in areas where there are overlapping um, places where people could get tests at different facilities, um, we can account for that increased uh, number of tests available. And the little map at the left, um, the yellow areas show places where um, tests are in high availability and the purple areas and the show places where tests are in low availability. The empty areas show places where tests are um, outside of the range specified for this analysis, which was 20 kilometers. Next slide, please. So the next thing that we look at is demand. How much testing capacity is needed? Again, both now and into the future. Um, to do this, we look at population density and disease burden, as well as current testing data. Um, so the little map that is shown here in the center shows um, population density with high population density areas being in bright yellow and lower population density areas being in purple and very low population density areas being in black. We often use spatial population data, case notification and testing data. Um, and sometimes we use country specific projections of the future uh, projections for TB testing needs. Next slide, please. So our last piece is access. How can TB diagnostic tools be made more geographically accessible? And we do this by incorporating publicly available road and transit network information to determine um, driving distance to each individual facilities. We use uh, administrative boundaries where available and rural urban categorizations if necessary to help us determine whether um, travel can be fast or quick in an area. 
We also uh, find the location of um, health facilities that may not have diagnostic capabilities, but could be connected through a specimen referral network to do sample collection um, and their relationship to the diagnostic facilities, both those that already exist and those that could be added in uh, network expansion. And then we use any information that the country has about their current referral linkage network um, in order to be able to incorporate that into the analysis and see where it could be expanded. Um, the little slide at the right shows uh, the areas that are covered within the driving distance of the di diagnostic facilities in blue and the areas that are covered within the referral network driving distances in gray. So the referral network uh, expands the capacity of the testing network. Next slide, please. Okay, so putting that all together, that means that we're taking a look at supply, um, how much testing capacity is currently available and where through gene expert module location and inventory. Demand, how much testing capacity is needed, and that can be customized for each uh, available data set and um, needs. Um, we often use population density and disease burden. And last, the accessibility through transit networks and referral facilities, um, and figuring out how much of the population is covered um, through these networks. Next slide, please. Okay. So I hope that this has covered some of the issues about why we would do spatial analysis for this diagnostic network analysis. Um, and then uh, the, the data requirements uh, that are needed. So um, we need things like uh, testing data for historical values, uh, gene expert module location and supply, um, and uh, some information regarding road networks and accessibility um, for this existing specimen referral network. Now I'm going to turn it over to our uh, to Mo again, and uh, then to our country teams. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. Really appreciate that background on the methodology. Of, you know, this fairly um, robust and technical activity. We'd like now to turn over to our colleague So Tut Ong from IDDS Act Project in Burma. Dr. So, please, your turn. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mo. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. This is Sue from IDDS Parma. Next slide, please. With the support of USAID, we conducted spatial analysis for DV diagnosis that network in Yangon region. We choose the specific region because uh, it is believed to be the highest pattern region in the country. And moreover, in 2019, more than one fourth of the TB cases and nearly half of the drug resistant TB cases were notified from the Yangon region. So, in 2019, uh, the Joint Monitoring Mission and WHO GSC Mission report said that the, the TB situation in Yangon uh, is close to crisis situation. So, they strongly recommended to expand the molecular. Uh, rapid molecular diagnostic capacity across the region. Next slide, please. So to expand the diagnostic network, first we need to identify where those uh, testing facilities are located and and what are the potential sites that we uh, we are going uh, we should expand the genes by testing and again and. Again, we also uh, need to know uh, how we can increase the population coverage. So with those regions, we conducted uh, that spatial analysis. Next slide, please. So uh, the first thing we have done is the data acquisition. We get the facility and program data from national TV program and national TV reference laboratories uh, for some information about the public uh, about the population like the population density or administrative boundaries we assess them from the publicly available data sources after that we undergo the uh, data integration process uh, which was quite tough uh, for us because uh, the spatial analysis was the first time in country to conduct uh, for the TB uh, diagnostic network. So most of the variable we use uh, were not previously uh, routinely used by the national TB program. So uh, after a lot of data cleaning and verification, uh, uh, we we have that ready to analyze this database. And another challenge that we face is the margin 
between the different data sets. For the laboratory statistics, most of them are facility based, but for the program uh, statistics, uh, they are like the township based because township is the basic management unit in our country. After we have the data set in hand, we uh, do two types of analysis. The first one is characterizing the utilization and demand, and, and second, uh, we characterize the accessibility. Next slide, please. Uh, for the utilization and demand, uh, we use the testing statistic for the James Bat and also for the SMIA microscopy because SMIA microscopy was the first line TB diagnostic text in 2019. So we can see the different uh, utilization of the testing across the region. Next slide, please. For the accessibility, we overlay the uh, genes by facility on the population density map, and we generated the buffer zone. So we uh, we we uh, we found that uh, 63 percent of the population uh, were living within five kilometer straight line distance from the nearest genes by facility. Next slide, please. From all those patient analysis, uh, we we can identify. We could identify the potential facility where uh, we are going to place the new genes by machines. Uh, we we have three consideration uh, to identify the candidate facility. The first one is the population coverage. Uh, we would like to uh, reduce the distance in the rural area, and we want to increase the coverage in the urban area. The second consideration is demand coverage. We focus on the area with the higher demand based on the program and, and testing data. And the third consideration is network coverage. And we uh, we purposely uh, uh, prioritize the uh, facility in the most central long, uh, location within the township. And then we set the criteria uh, to, to identify as the candidate facility. Next slide, please. And then we have a list of uh, candidate facility, which were potential sites to expand the genes by machine. Among 170 facility, we identify 65 candidate facility. Next slide, please. Among those facilities, uh, for better efficiency, we need to prioritize, we need to select the sites to uh, prioritize in, in expanding the genes bed network. So uh, in this case, we need to consider other contacts we have further. So a lot of coordination and collaboration work were done to identify two candidate facilities uh, across the region. So finally, we found that uh, by expanding two genes bed machines in the existing diagnostic network, uh, more 10% of population will be covered within five kilometer distance from the nearest facility. Next slide, please. On the other hand, we also conduct the spatial analysis for the private genes bed network because after the uh, pol political uh, uh, with, with with the current political crisis situation, uh, public facilities are facing a serious human resource uh, shortage problems. So, so we uh, uh, we we are considering to put the genes by machines in the private facility. So we identified 63 private facility, and among them, we selected four facility in the densely populated area. If we can establish the uh, student reference network between the different facility, uh, our private data genes by network will cover 70% of population within five kilometer distance. Next slide, please. So this spatial analysis uh, was done with the general support from the USAID and, and the National TV program and National TV reference laboratory, they contributed the uh, program and laboratory data uh, to, this analyze, to this analysis. And during the data valid validation process, uh, they, uh, they have contributed a lot of work. And without the contribution by the TV stakeholders, such as USA, Global Fund, WHO, and the other TV implementing partners, we'll not be able to make the meaningful recommendation to select the sites for better uh, efficiency in expanding the uh, rapid molecular diagnosis network. Uh, thank you, everyone. Over to you, Mo. Thank you, Dr. So. 
really impressive work you and your colleagues have been able to do and really interesting to see how you were able to use the methodology just in a specific region. Before we turn over to our next speaker, I'd like to remind everyone that please use the question and answer feature to send questions for the speakers for our moderated session. Now I'd like to turn over to Dr. Ramon to present the experiences from the Philippines. Thank you and over to you, Dr. Ramon. Thank you, Mo, and good day, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Um, so next slide, please. So I'll be talking about the country's journey um, towards uh, laboratory network expansion, especially with the use of diagnostic network uh, spatial analysis or diagnostic network optimization. Looking at the first uh, spatial analysis done in 2017, uh, the, the current uh, expansion, and then uh, we did the second TB lab network spatial analysis uh, 2020, and uh, the third TB laboratory network spatial analysis and the way forward. Next slide, please. Now, in 2017, we developed the Philippine Strategic TB Elimination Plan. This TB Elimination Plan aims to address the growing concern of the very high incidence of TB in the country. And it was a sub-plan for 2017 up to 2022. From this, uh, we developed a sub-plan specific for the TB Laboratory Network. And its objectives uh, center around uh, improving access to TB diagnostic services, ensuring continuous availability of TB, uh, services, uh, strengthening the quality management system of the labs and improving uh, information utilization and research conduct. So it actually boils down to improving access to these diagnostic services. And so we did a uh, diagnostic network optimization back then. So next slide, please. Now, in the first uh, TB lab network spatial analysis, the challenges then were uh, there was very low uh, WRD utilization. So uh, the use of gene expert was not the primary diagnostic test at the time. There was limited access to diagnostic services and there was sample referral, uh, there was a lacking sample referral system. So what we did was um, with, the spa with the spatial analysis and, or the network optimization, uh, we mapped out the current TB burden, testing demand, the diagnostic network structure. We identified the extent and distribution of gaps and developed diagnostic network models with machine allocation to better reach the missing persons with TB. So what is shown here in the map is the 2017 modeled uh, landscape or modeled lab network, wherein 522 sites were proposed, while for 2022, 889 sites uh, were proposed. So the mapping of these models uh, shows the placement of sites and tests. They took into consideration the utilization, the estimated demand, and the distance between referring facilities. Uh, and also with, the, with this, uh, only straight line distances uh, were considered. So the model output included an allocation list of uh, machines, and this was validated in the regions uh, by our regional coordinators and was used in the submission of the concept note and proposal to the Global Fund for network expansion and also as reference in establishing an optimized specimen referral network. Next slide, please. So in actuality, the expansion of the laboratory network from 2018, uh, we had 322 laboratories. In 2019, uh, it expanded to 451 laboratories. In 2020, 490, and in 2021, 587. Uh, next slide, please. In 2020, we did the second TB lab network spatial analysis. So of course we had challenges back then because of the ongoing pandemic and it caused major disruption in TB services. So introducing innovations in screening, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention um, was seen as an intervention, but where should we uh, place the new tools? Um, six provinces uh, were actually selected. Three of them were found to have good and excellent level of population coverage and geographic accessibility. 
and improvements were uh, recommended to add spare capacity. Uh, two of these areas, Cebu and NCR of the, and the National Capital Region, were found to have unmet needs. So in the map above, uh, the first map on the left shows the current map of the existing 14 uh, WRD sites and distance from uh, these sites. Now, the distance covered were actual road networks in contrast to the previous laboratory spatial analysis. Map two shows the population coverage within five kilometers, while map three uh, shows 20 kilometers. Now, based on these, uh, there is low accessibility to WRDs because travel uh, to testing is greater than 10 kilometers in 58% of the 65 uh, labs that were mapped. And there's also low population coverage because only 18% of the population can reach WRDs uh, within walking distance. However, 83% can reach WRDs within 20 kilometers. So the right is, uh, uh, the fourth map on the right uh, shows the proposal to pu put up additional uh, sites. And this will reduce max travel distance from 33 kilometers to 18 kilometers. And then 52% of the population would be able to reach a WRD lab within walking distance and 98% within 20 kilometers. Considering the valuable learnings from this analysis, the next step was to expand the analysis to the entire country. And this will also guide the next phase of the lab expansion as the first DNO analysis only covered until 2022, only in congruence with the timeline of the country's elimination plan and the lab network strat plan. Next slide, please. So for the third TB lab network spatial analysis, the goal was to improve uh, TB diagnosis uh, with the target to test 3.5% of the population by 2023. So the objectives were to identify existing diagnostic facilities, candidate facilities, and improve access and referral network through geospatial analysis. We also will use these decision-making models to select and prioritize candidate facilities to increase population coverage using population target. So the first step, uh, which was data cleaning, so we used as inputs our integrated TB information system, a health facilities a database, um, functionality and installations of gene expert sites, smear microscopy and case notifications from 2019, road networks, uh, facility locations for testing data, and records of machine outages from gene expert size, uh, sites to characterize utilization. The third step, which is to generate distance matrix, focuses on the road network data with a max distance limited to 10 kilometers in urban and 20 kilometers in rural areas. Step four was country, were country-specific projections, barangay level targets. So the barangays are basic management unit for population coverage and testing targets. Capacity, accessibility, and utilization were also examined versus targets. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the findings from the baseline examination of accessibility, capacity, and utilization of the TB laboratory network. Now, in terms of accessibility, geographic placement of facilities is strong. The map uh, shows uh, mostly blue, which means less distance in kilometers, but there are still gaps in between. 81% of the population is within 20 kilometers of an existing uh, WRD lab. And if referral facilities were included, 93% of the population will be well within 20 kilometers. In terms of capacity, uh, currently high, but there are still shortfalls versus the targets as seen in some areas, which are in the darker colors. Now, in terms of utilization, which is actually one of the biggest issues right now in the country, 54% of the WRD labs have a utilization of only less than one test per day per module. Now, this low utilization could be a re result of incomplete data or low testing rates relative to module supply. So in these three uh, scenarios, utilization looks mostly the most important thing to look at moving forward for our uh, expansion. Next slide, please. In terms of expansion for the referral network, uh, we need to link referring facilities Linking referral facilities to existing WRD labs within 20 kilometers will drastically improve accessibility and will increase the population coverage from 81% to 93%. Now, in some areas, 
addition of modules, machines, uh, will be able to um, augment uh, the population, the, the need for testing and to establish uh, WRD laboratories. Now, in terms of addition of machines, select uh, facilities to, uh, there, might, there, is, there is a need to select facilities to achieve similar gains with increasing referral network coverage. If we want to use a 10 kilometer service area, 700 of the 1,010 candidate sites would be selected. But if, we will use, if, but if we will use 20 kilometers, 479 of 486 candidate sites may be selected for the additionality of modules or machines. Next slide, please. In terms of further recommendations for accessibility, we need to have targeted specimen referral programs. And this is needed for less accessible areas or for mobile testing. And this is currently done in the Philippines with the use of our specimen transport riders or what we call striders now. Um, we will look into actually um, making this more efficient in, in, in the coming months and uh, during our uh, come in the coming years in order to achieve uh, this higher population coverage. In terms of capacity, regions where no additional uh, where no additional facilities needed may still need module addition to meet the targets while in others, new facilities and more modules may be needed. In terms of utilization, which is likely the biggest issue right now facing our country, we need to look into strategies beyond the addition of machines necessary to, to improve uh, coverage against targets. And our way forward is that IDDS would provide feedback on priority rank candidate facilities and the referral networks to verify suitability from the country team. And the country will plan for further expansion based on this analysis. And what is actually very timely right now is that we will be integrating other disease programs uh, in view of universal health care. So we will look into actually uh, applying what we've learned from this third and, uh, of course, scaled up uh, network spatial analysis and try to cascade this down to the regions in order to both identify facilities that are very suitable for expansion while also improving the sample referral network and make it more um, achievable and more efficient uh, for its implementation. Next slide, please. I would like to um, share my gratitude to the Department of Health, uh, the Disease Prevention and Control Bureau, uh, the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine, National TB Reference Lab, and of course, the Lab Network uh, Strengthening Section, USAID, the Infectious Disease Detection and Surveillance, uh, FHI 360 TB Innovations, and Global Fund and the Philippine Business for Social Progress, uh, SESTB project. Thank you very much and over to you, Mo. Thank you, Dr. Ramon. That's, it's very exciting to watch the progression of the, um, the analyses over time and through the systems. I'd like to pass over to the final panelist on our, our, of our speakers right now, um, Ebert, going to share experiences from Zimbabwe. Please, Ebert, go ahead. Thank you, Mo, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I'm going to speak about uh, our experience in conducting this lab uh, network spatial analysis. So I will begin with the background and methodology, the findings and recommendations uh, that were brought up. <coughs> About on board and then the implementation of those uh, recommendations. Next slide, please. So in 2019 and 2020, the IDDS project supported a TB diagnostic network assessment uh, in Zimbabwe. And uh, as part of this uh, network assessment, a consultant was hired to assist with the uh, laboratory network spatial analysis. And uh, according to the national TB uh, National TB program uh, diagnostic algorithm, uh, the use of uh, molecular WHO recommended uh, rapid diagnostics as the initial tool for the diagnosis of TB was uh, actually in implementation. And uh, the objective of the lab network uh, spatial analysis was to assist uh, the NTP in the placement and distribution of rapid molecular diagnostic devices. And at that time, uh, mainly gene expert. Uh, in an effort to improve uh, coverage and access to 
is a molecular WRDs. Next slide, please. So how did we do this? Uh, we had uh, to do a mapping of all diagnostic sites by one test type, uh, smear microscopy, expert line probe assay, culture, and phenotype DS DST. However, um, I must uh, emphasize that uh, the emphasis was only mainly on uh, expert testing. We also provided GPS coordinates for each diagnostic site, uh, compiled and uh, collected data by test type for the period 2019 to 2020. And uh, we had some presentation of scenarios for the placement and deployment of uh, additional gene expert devices looking at the travel distance from the existing uh, gene expert sites. Next slide, please. So uh, the findings from this uh, special analysis was that one third of the population then lived within a five kilometer radius of an expert testing site. So it was recommended that a functional and nationwide specimen referral system was essential to ensure a high level of population uh, level access to expert testing. And uh, this would ensure that a majority of 85% of referring facilities were within an easily reachable distance for approximately 50 kilometer uh, driving distance, but still the network uh, had uh, gaps. So if all health facilities were integrated into a nationwide specimen referral system, this will improve to 60% of the population uh, living within a five kilometer radius of a health facility that could uh, refer specimens. Next slide, please. And uh, also it was uh, observed that the current spatial distribution of expert testing sites uh, would ensure that the majority of all health facilities or potentially referring specimen and uh, specimens are within a shape of distance of approximately 50 kilometer radius distance driving distance at this network still at gaps so about 15 percent of facilities that would face specimen for expert testing were further than 50 kilometer uh, driving distance and uh two percent of facilities were further than 100 kilometers which will pose a barrier to efficient network integration so an expansion and decentralization of the expert testing networks by, for example, 36 locations would significantly improve access to expert testing through specimen referral, and 5% of the facilities will be located uh, beyond uh, 50 kilometer driving distance. So there were further needs and opportunities for network expansion, e.g. to avoid expert testing sites having to save too many uh, referring sites. Next slide, please. So just uh, uh, highlighting uh, how far the implementation of the those recommendations are at now. So the first one was to expand and centralize the existing testing network by adding between 30 to 40 expert testing sites. So at the time of the uh, special analysis, the country had a total of 120 sites providing gene expert testing services. And uh, to date, 29 additional molecular WRDs, that is gene expert and true nut sites, were established uh, with uh, support from the Global Fund, uh, USIDs, and uh, other partners. So the integrated specimen transportation system was also rolled out uh, in uh, July of 2021 20, to cover all the 10 provinces of the country. The other recommendation was that uh, there was a need to conduct a detailed planning for a nationwide specimen referral system considering the uh, international standards for a maximum of uh, 100 to 150 kilometer driving distance per day per driver, and also considering specimen quality requirements for both TB and HIV based on the timelines and transit conditions. And also considering turnaround times and transport frequencies, there was also need to uh, improve and project and balance resources at already existing sites uh, e.g. the gene expert modules, uh, workforce with the resource for specimen referral, looking at fuel, bikes, and workforce. And uh, so to date, uh, what has happened is that uh, there's been a rerouting process which is underway in the final stages. And the ICST was also rolled out to all districts. Initially, this was uh, mainly in 40 PEPFA supported districts. And additional motorbikes were also added to the existing fleet uh, 
including additional vehicles, which are now uh, located at uh, provincial hubs. And the multiplex testing is being implemented for TB, HIV, uh, viral load EID, and also COVID-19. And uh, also, yes, uh, IDD supported the development of a multiplexing guide, which is uh, almost uh, going under the printing processes. Next slide, please. So this slide is just uh, showing us uh, the distribution of uh, gene expert size uh, bef uh, before 20, February 2020, and uh, what has happened uh, in by June 2022, where there has been an additional 22 nut sites and uh, nine gene expert sites uh, to uh, complement uh, what was um, <coughs> existing then. Uh, thank you. And over to you, Mo. Thank you, Ebert. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our panelists, Claire Lay, So Tut Ong, Ramon Basilio, and Ebert Mutunzi for your presentations. At this point, I'd like to turn over to our colleague, Laurel McMillan, who will host a moderated question and answer session. Please know that do you Q&A is open and that we will respond to as many questions as we can here. And we can also maybe share some follow-up questions after the fact, but please do keep them coming now. I've had a couple great ones so far and looking forward to more. Laurel, please over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mo, and thank you to all the panelists for the terrific presentation so far. Um, several questions have come through already, so with that, I will start off with a question for Dr. So from Burma. Um, did you assess second-line drug susceptibility testing in your spatial analysis, or did you just focus on gene expert testing? Uh, uh, we just focus on expert MDV RIF testing because there was a need to uh, expand uh, the uh, molecular rapid diagnosis testing uh, in the region. So we just focus on that. For the second line DST testing, we only have a, a handful amount of uh, laboratories in the country and MDV didn't have any plan to expand or relocate the facility. So uh, there was no need to conduct space analysis for the uh, second line DST testing. However, uh, for the moment, NTP is rapidly adopting uh, molecular DSD, uh, expert MDV HDR testing in the country. So uh, IDDS is continuing to support technical assistance uh, to NTP. So uh, thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Dr. So. Um, the next question is for Claire. Um, Claire, there's a common theme of first needing to assess demand in each of the countries discussed but the methods in assessing demand have largely focused on using population density and case notification rate, with case notification rate being notoriously problematic for understanding subnational burden. Are there any other spatial methods being used for assessing TB burden subnationally to obtain the best estimates of demand on a more granular level? For case notification rate, where we've had it, um, it's been at the facility level um, in general. So we're working with facility level statistics about not just patients who are notified, but patients who were notified and had access to bacterial confirmation. In some cases, those data can be detailed enough to tell us whether they had access to bacterial confirmation through smear microscopy or through molecular diagnostic testing. And in those cases, we assume that if patients uh, received positive notifications but did not receive access to bacterial confirmation services or molecular, molecular diagnostics, that they're sort of an unmet need uh, population. Um, and so with those facility level data, we can often get at some more of the granular questions. Um, in practice, these tend to be fairly similar to overall population values, except for in places that have really strong supply. Um, and in some cases where we don't have access to notification data, we've used smear microscopy testing data from facilities that don't have molecular diagnostics so that we can get a read of the current uh, unmet demand. Where we see patients that are accessing uh, molecular diagnostics, we consider that to be a case of met demand where there's uh, capacity for those people. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Claire. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Ramon. Um, in any of the spatial analyses conducted in the Philippines, did you find a need to relocate some WRD machines? 
Thank you, Laurel, and thank you for the question. Yes, uh, there were instances uh, on the ground wherein machines were needed uh, or machines were actually relocated from the assigned or the targeted facilities. Now, this has, uh, in our expansion, there is a process of verification um, at the regional level with the regional TB laboratory teams. Uh, they'll go to the facilities, check on the, um, the site, look into the availability of human resource, especially uh, during the COVID pandemic. Um, a lot of human resource, a lot of resources were diverted. So um, there was a need to actually look into more suitable sites, not based on the spatial analysis, but more on the functionality of the sites, if they can actually accept. So uh, this has been ongoing, but most of the sites that were targeted, especially in the first two analysis, um, most of them were uh, provided for for the expansion. And over to you, Laurel. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramon. Uh, the next question is for Ebert from Zimbabwe. Um, can you explain how the geographic information in, Zimbab in Zimbabwe is updated for use in the spatial analysis? Is it difficult to update? Yes, thank you, So I think for our case, uh, uh, the issue was uh, on um, getting complete data. So the objective was mainly to get uh, at least 90% of the test data from all the facilities. Uh, but for data, for expert was uh, not that difficult because uh, the majority of the devices were connected to the GX alert, but also getting a uh, Data for other tests like smear microscopy was very difficult because uh, in terms of recording and reporting, this was mainly based on uh, 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 ad copies. But uh, also getting some GPS coordinates for some of these sites uh, was also challenging. We had to uh, sometimes call those that we knew it um, uh, were connected to, to the mobile network, but also sometimes the network was very difficult sometimes because of issues to do with electricity. But I think with the IDDS support uh, over the past two years, uh, this has been made easier because uh, uh, we are now able to provide all the GPS coordinates for all the facilities in the country where we had some, uh, uh, some in engagements with all the provinces and districts to get this data. Thank you and over. Thank you. Uh, it looks like our next question is for Dr. So. Um, when choosing new diagnostic sites in any given geographic area, how does the team choose between public versus private sites for new diagnostic machines? Um, if within a particular geographic area, a private site has higher patient volume, should that site be favored for machine placement? Yes. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Laurie. Um, uh, it is an interesting question because, uh, uh, as I'm presented, uh, to identify the candidate facility, we can uh, uh, conduct the analysis and we can identify the site. But to prioritize the uh, the uh, selected sites among those uh, candidate facilities, uh, we need to consider a lot of uh, contextual factors, uh, such as, uh, uh, for example, our country is. Uh, is in the hot climate zone, so uh, they, for the James Bond machine, they cannot run above 30 degrees Celsius. So in, in this kind of thing, uh, we need to discuss a lot with the uh, TV stakeholders and the implementing partner. So in a township, there will be a private facility, a public facility, but at the private facility, if there is no no infrastructure to host the James Bond machine, and then uh, we cannot select that kind of site. So uh, to make site selection, we need to do a lot of coordination and collaboration works with our implementing partners. So I, I hope that uh, my response will answer the question. Okay. Yes, thank you, Dr. So. Um, let's see, another question for Dr. Ramon. Uh, were smaller size WRD machines considered given low utilization rate on those machines? Thank you, Laurel, and thank you for the question. Um, specifically for the first, I remember that um, 
there were some sites that were allocated uh, gene expert two module machines and we strategically placed this especially in areas when uh, utilization or access was prioritized over uh, capacity um, and during the second actually the second spatial analysis dealt more with true nat placement we really wanted to look into areas which would not substitute uh, the current gene expert load but really look into additionality of testing and of course what we have right now for TrueNAT is that we have the two placer uh, two module machines or two placer machines now so we have in typical uh, in in uh, based on the previous uh, previous analyses um, we had we had had expansions using a gene expert two module machine, machines and gx4 machines and for COVID, uh, we actually did some gene expert 16 modules. This is not related really to the spatial analysis, but more on the capacity to do both TB and COVID testing. So we actually placed gene expert 16 module machines in um, tertiary hospitals to augment the testing for both TB and COVID. Thank you. Over to you, Lauren. Thank you, Dr. Ramon. Um, this is a question for Claire. Um, about how long does the spatial analysis take on average from kickoff to the presentation of final results? Thank you, Laurel. Um, so uh, the largest portion of the analysis is actually the process of getting all of the data sets together and um, cleaning and linking the data sets. So that can vary somewhat based on um, past data collection practices in the country. Some places are moving from um, paper-based collection systems to electronic-based collection systems, um, or they've significantly restructured uh, the way that they are um, recording where their facilities are located, addresses and things like that. Um, and that piece can take uh, several months. Um, so typically once we get to the place where we have a cleaned data set and we know where facilities are located and where the molecular diagnostics are located, the next part of the process takes around a month. Um, so, uh, and, and then there can be follow on questions where we go back and forth with the strategic teams to make sure that any criteria that were incorporated into the spatial analysis are incorporated um, properly based on their plans. Um, and sometimes there are updates and things like that. So that piece can also take a, a bit of time to make sure that everything is uh, matching up with plans. Thank you, Claire. Um, and it looks like we have one last question. This question is for Alex Durena. Um, what is the main takeaway from performing these spatial analyses that will be used to direct future tuberculosis programming? Thank you, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. So, um, so I think that so, um, I think that we 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 still have a long way to go. Um, for for this for 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 this approach. So so for um, the special analysis have been very important for countries to assess you know their dams capacity needs, identify their gaps and help them to, to select the best scenarios possible to improve their, their, their dance coverage and expand its expansions. Um, we, we know that, you know, it's also requires like good quality data and accurate geospatial information in order to be able to perform you know, those, those analysis and, 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 and come up with, with the, the, the exact approach that, that will help the country. But um, we we take we think that it is it will be important to 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 you know expand this analysis consider um, just susceptibility testing see how we can we can we can um, improve um, access to 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 second night to first and second and DST um, also con consider um, including other disease in in, 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 in in the analysis. This is something that have been requested by many countries and to it will require more work, more um um you know this analysis require you know a strong let's say data cleaning and 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 having more 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 you know, um EID testing um data to 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 incorporate into this work will 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 be 
would be very challenging. But you know, it 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 may be the way um, we will need to go um, in order to 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 be able to 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 consider the the the, the overall demand and see how how best we can we can um, advise countries to 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 plan for the future. But 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 mainly, I think that um, the next step would be first to 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 enrich this 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 approach by by um, including first and second and DST and, and and being able to 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 advise countries to 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 reinforce um 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 um, um second line first line second line DST. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, um, and thank you to all the panelists for answering the questions. Uh, over to you, Mo. Thank you, Laurel. Thank you for moderating this conversation. It's it's just a it's a really fascinating subject, and and so happy to see all the thought that's going into uh, expanding diagnostic testing. I'd like to thank all of our participants for joining us. For more information or to discuss how your country could benefit from a laboratory network spatial analysis. Uh, please email me at the address on the screen if we go back a slide. There's my, please uh, feel free to um, email me um, at that address and if um, one of my colleagues could drop that email address also into the chat, that would be great. IDDS is proud to support TB affected countries to detect and diagnose all persons with tuberculosis. Until we find every person with TB and link them with the appropriate treatment, we will not eliminate this ancient scourge. I'd like to thank all of our speakers today, So Tut Ong, Ramon Basilio, Alex Durena, Claire Lay, Laurel McMillan, Ebert Mutanzi, and Amy Piatek. Thank you all. Have a good day. Have a good evening. It's been our pleasure. Thank you.